Labor Day Camping Trip Gone Wrong by Jera F. Hey Swamp Dweller, I've become a pretty big fan of your podcast and wanted to send you these stories. I did not personally experience this, but my parents did. My parents were camping at a campground that I grew up going to, called Boggs Creek. At the time, it was Labor Day weekend of 1996, and my parents set up camp to enjoy their long weekend off. Everything went well until Sunday, when everyone started to pack up and leave. My parents decided to stay an extra night and would leave that Monday since they didn't have to be at work until Tuesday. My parents noticed everyone else was going, so later that day they drove through the campground and literally saw no signs of anyone else. Everyone had left. They were the only two in the area. Late that Sunday night, they were sitting around the campfire, eating supper, and suddenly felt that they were being watched by someone or something. Shortly after, they heard what sounded like someone chopping wood across the creek. They stopped and shined a light in the woods, but they saw nothing. At about that time, they heard something or someone letting out a horrifying scream that sent shivers down both of their bodies. Right then, my dad told my mom that he would stand guard with his pistol while she packed up the campsite, and they were leaving that night ASAP. My mom packed up the whole camp and put it in the car so fast that they held lanterns in their lap as if they were still hot when they left. They drove about a mile down the road and pulled over to put the lanterns in the back as they were cooled off. They never knew what was out there across the creek in the woods, but they knew something or someone was. Another story is that my dad was canoeing down the Etowah River in Georgia with a few family friends. They left their vehicles at the exit point, and another friend drove them up to the drop-off entry point, and they were going to float down the river to their cars. They were sailing along for a few hours and suddenly it darkened quickly. As they floated down the river trying to reach the exit point, they heard something walking along the riverbank. They could listen to the sound of snapping tree limbs, and whatever it was sounded big. They got creeped out, hurried down the river, and went under a bridge. After they passed the bridge, they were coming up to the exit to get out, and about that time, they heard what sounded like something snapping a rather large tree limb in half. Whatever it was, let out a loud holler near the bridge as well. It did not sound human. They exited the water, found their vehicles, loaded their gear, and quickly left. They didn't go back for a long while after that. They think it might have been a Bigfoot, but nobody is for sure. Swamp Dweller, thank you for taking the time to read these creepy experiences. North Georgia mountains are beautiful, but hold many weird and unexplainable things. Backyard Camping Nightmare by... Bathtub Jen Hi, I grew up in southern New Hampshire and had some exciting times in East Derry. I grew up on a cul-de-sac with a police captain and a detective as my neighbors. Many weird and strange things happened while living there, most connected to the house. I had this type of shadow person. It would take shape of my family members, and years after moving from that house, my older brother would tell me, Whatever it was, it liked you. Which brings us to one of the many stories I have to share with this show. My best friend lived five houses from me, and her parents owned a pop-up camper. Their yard was right up onto some woods. It was located on the side of their house, with a door the family used as a main entrance. Being the young 12-14 to 14 year olds we were, we had many sleepovers, with other kids in the neighborhood of course. We had a few experiences, and I'll tell you the most haunting one. This night, it was just her and I messing around the yard on the edge of the woods. We're both girls. At that age, we would bicker over the dumbest things. This night, it was her throwing a piece of gum at me and it getting lost between the mattresses and the lining of the camper. She wasn't willing to give me another piece, leading us to butting heads. We were bickering back and forth about her giving me another piece when we both went dead quiet. Suddenly... We heard what sounded like footsteps coming out from the woods, and slowly circling the RV. Then came some unintelligible talking. I don't really know how to describe it other than it was like right outside of our window, but it still sounded like it was far away. It was definitely a man's voice and we could not make out what was being said. It almost sounded like it was in another language, gibberish if you will. We looked at each other with concern and I remember her taking off her socks, 
They were fuzzy and new, and she didn't want to get them ruined when running away. It was just us making the 15-foot sprint to the side door of the house, inside and up the stairs to her room while grabbing the house phone on the way. Her parents were unfortunately drunks at the time, so we didn't feel like waking them. Instead, we did the only rational thing and called my house. My mom ended up driving around the neighborhood two times, only to call us back and tell us that she saw nothing. We were so freaked out that we slept on the floor beside each other. Where we slept was under the window that overlooked her front yard, and I'm unsure when we fell asleep, but we both remember hearing raking and digging before we did. This is a story going on almost 20 years ago now. I am to this day still friends with my childhood best friend. If I ever tell this story or other ones that happened and someone doubts it, I can definitely try my best to get them to share their side of the story. A lot of weird stuff takes place in Derry. I know this wasn't the creepiest story in the woods, but honestly I gotta tell you, it's something that made me very wary of going out in the woods alone or even in general. The Thing in the Woods by Anonymous when I was very young, we lived in this tiny town, I guess you could call it. It honestly only had three streets, two street lights, and about 50 houses total. All of the town kids would get together and play pickup games of baseball and such during the summer months. This particular evening, after the sun went down, we decided to play laser tag. There were about 10 of us, and all of us had our own set of tag vest and laser guns. We basically took over one section of the town and would run through the yards, hide behind garages, run in the woods, all the good stuff. Anything we wanted to do. We split into five teams of two. It was with my stepbrother at the time, Ryan, who was on my team. As I mentioned earlier, there were three main streets in this town and lots of alleyways. One of the streets was the easternmost street and it was bordered by a marsh and some woods on one side of the homes on the other. Ryan and I were running down this street, thinking we had seen one of the other teams running through a yard. We were going to block them in and shoot them so Ryan and I split up. He went west and I stayed on the eastern road bordering the woods. This was a scary road at night, if I'm honest with you. The houses are a little dilapidated on the left and the woods on the right have some ruins of old farmhouses scattered throughout them. The marsh attracted a lot of frogs and other animals so it was always very loud. I continued walking along and soon became distracted with the cracking of twigs and leaves from the woods. My heart started to race and I was frozen in fear. I just couldn't move though. I looked to my right and there was an old dead tree and I swore that just for a second I saw movement behind the trunk. I stared at it, waiting for it to move again. I saw the dark tall figure lean its head around the trunk of the tree. I could not see any features in detail because it was night time but I could make out the dark, solid figure. It was standing upright. This told me it was indeed time for me to skedaddle. I ran home, stayed inside for the rest of the night, and I didn't even bother telling my stepbrother. He later came in mad at me because I abandoned him. Today, I wonder if this was the same thing that chased my dad when he was a kid. I will have to share his story in the future, but for now, I'll leave you with that little bit of a cliffhanger. Evil Woods by Abby K. Hey there, Swamp Dweller. It's been a long time since I've sent in a story here. This story is supposed to be very short, but due to some details I don't want to leave out, it might be a little bit longer than intended. Anyways, here it goes. This happened when I was in high school, sometime around 2011 or 2012. I went to a boarding school and the school was located at the countryside, if I may say. From the side of the boys dormitory is nothing but forest, miles and miles to the horizon. We all knew the school was very haunted and no one ventured into those woods be it daytime or nighttime. Although some stubborn ones would try to go out there and face their fears, but they would always live to regret the decisions. This is the story of one of those guys. Let's call him Max. Max was seen as those athletic type guys. Big body, tall, you know what I mean. He's always said there was nothing in those woods and he can spend the night there, blah, blah, blah. He got on a bet with a friend at around 11pm. He set off 
to spend the night there, apparently, all alone. But about an hour or so later, his screaming could be heard. He screamed, Jesus! Everyone was scared to follow up, so they contacted campus security, and about eight of them came out there and looked for him. They found him, but he was completely unconscious. To this day, five or six years later, Max has lost the ability to speak, and whatever he saw has affected him psychologically. No one knows what he saw, and no one is ready to go follow up and go into those woods to rewrite history. Well, not yet at least. To my main story, one night, obviously midnight, a friend, Mike, woke up and started calling us to come see something. We all sleep in bunk beds in the dormitory. His was right by the glass window. His was right by the glass window, so he could see outside rather well. We went to his bed, and what we saw, I still can't really understand. It was a giant ball of fire. They were a few feet apart, at least 100 meters between the trees. The flame fire thingy was just bouncing from one to another like it was no one's business. We looked for quite a few minutes until the fire eventually disappeared, and we all went back to bed entirely confused. I tried to watch it again on several occasions, but it never really happened anymore. I would stay up all night. Sorry if this doesn't make much sense. I, I wanted to be sure to get this story into you because it's so anomalous and makes no sense to me. What happened to Max in those woods? I don't think we'll ever know. Why did he lose the ability to speak? Was it just some health condition he already had, or did something more happen? Also, what the heck was that fireball bouncing tree from tree? None of this makes any sense to me the more I think about it. I Discovered Something Horrific in the Forest by Creepy Texan Hello Swamp Dweller, my name is Garrett, and I'm going to share with you and the people of the swamp the time my good friend Robert and I encountered something very frightening in our local forest. It has been almost three years since it occurred, and I still wonder how I'm still alive to tell the tale. Anyway, here it goes. It all started on a fantastic October evening in Texas. My friend Robert and I were wondering how to spend this evening on a Saturday night. So, being the thrill-seekers we were, we decided to go on a walk in our local forest and do some urbex exploring since there were some abandoned buildings in that area. I'm not sure of the history behind these buildings, but apparently they were a part of some sort of old settlement from the mid-late 1800s that was mysteriously abandoned in the 1920s. I have tried to ask more about the history from people in our small town, but for some reason they refused to talk about it. Additionally, they warned all the other teenagers and myself to not go into that forest at night. But of course, being the cocky young teenagers we were, Robert ignored that warning and explored the buildings. Once we all got our stuff packed in our backpacks, including my newly gifted camcorder, we set out for the forest at about 6.45pm and got there at about 7 o'clock, so the sun was pretty much gone at this point. Once we got there, the parking lot only contained one other vehicle, a Ford Expedition. This seemed a bit odd as it was nightfall, yet there were still some hikers out and about in the park. Not that it was strange for us to be there so late in the day, but I just shrugged it off quickly and started recording on my camera once we began our 30 minute hike to the abandoned buildings. The walk went entirely normal for the most part until we got about 10 minutes away from the settlement. It started with the crickets and other animals going quiet all around us, which I know means a predator is normally nearby. I am somewhat of an avid hunter, so I guess I would know this, as well as listening to horror stories on YouTube. Robert and I were on edge, but we refused to turn back. Instead, we slowed down our pace and minimized the number of times we would use our flashlights, since we did not want to give away our position so easily. Eventually, we made it to our destination with no further interruptions. In front of us, we were greeted by a building that seemed to resemble an old church with what appeared to be tiny houses and maybe a couple of stores surrounding it. Of course, the buildings were so old and ran down that it was honestly hard to tell what they could have been. Strangely enough, the church appeared to be in the middle of the settlement. Now, I don't know if it's just me, but if you see an abandoned town with an old, creepy church, chances are some terrible crap is going to go down. Robert and I agreed that we should probably check the buildings to make sure there are no squatters or anything. 
We wanted to save the church for last anyway because it was the most uneasy. We spent about 30 to 45 minutes exploring the different buildings with no interest other than some cryptic messages engraved in the wood of the building, which read out like, We must leave before it's too late and they always watch. Now, if the town's eerie atmosphere wasn't enough to freak me and Robert out, the creepy silence that seemed to follow us around definitely was enough to make us crap ourselves, especially with the previous settlement history. Could this be connected to the town's abandonment? What were they so afraid of? There were so many questions that needed answers. I had to keep going. After exploring the last building before the church, we took maybe 10 breaths each before entering the church. Upon entering the church, it immediately made us gag with the smell of what I can only describe as pure death and it seemed to be coming from the room below the building. A basement? That's what I could only assume. A trap door followed by a ladder led down to a secret room, and as we made our way down, that horrible smell seemed to get even more robust. We even had to use our jackets as like makeshift gas masks. Once we all got down, we were met with a vast catacomb-like room with some sort of object in the center, illuminated by a dim candle hanging from a ceiling. Me and Robert were very reluctantly making our way toward the thing with my camera still recording to discover that it was half of a person's bloody body. A female that seemed to be in her mid to late twenties, very possibly a young urban explorer like Robert and myself. We both threw up upon seeing this gruesome sight. It was worth mentioning too that while we were down there, we never used our tack lights to see what we were surrounded by, so we both opened up our lights. I almost fainted on sight when we saw that there was maybe 20 horrifying looking humanoid creatures surrounding us. They were probably no taller than us. They were naked, skinny with long, thin, and wiry hair coming down from their chest. Their eyes were black as night, and their gaping mouths were dripping with blood. Their fingernails looked like they were overgrown and shaped like steak knives. They resembled the clown from Saw, except without the makeup. The hair was much thinner. And once they all knew we saw them, they all in unison gave this deathly shriek. A shriek that I believe could be heard in any nightmare. I didn't even know a living thing on this planet could produce that noise until this very moment. But then Robert yelled at the top of his lungs. Run! As we both climbed up the ladder in record time, it was an absolute miracle that not me or Robert got dragged down by those horrific creatures. We made it to the church as fast as we could and slammed the door behind us. With the screaming still being heard, we took a minute to catch our breaths as we discovered, with our lights, probably 50 different eyes coming from all the buildings we had previously explored. Upon seeing this, we bolted out of the entire settlement. I dropped my camera behind me in the process. I know, cliche, but I didn't realize this until many, many minutes. In about 10 to 15 minutes, we made it back to my truck with the Ford Expedition still there. We could now safely recollect and calm down from our horrific experience. We then concluded that the car belonged to the girl killed by those things under the church. It was a miracle that we made it out, but unfortunately she didn't, and my heart goes out to her family. The next day we led police to the location and they found her body right where we saw it. Only this time those creatures were not there. She was eventually identified as 26-year-old woman, Chloe Bex. We tried telling the police our story, but they did not buy it. Except for one, Sheriff Walker, a 60-year-old native of our small town. During the investigation on the site, he came up to me and Robert and said, Now you know why we tell you not to go into the forest at night. My House in the Woods by Jason S. Back in 2013, I was visiting my cousins at their house in the small town of Buena Vista, Virginia. I would go there fairly often as it was only two hours away from my own house. This wasn't your average house though. It was on a 50 acre plantation built in 1742. All around the house were flat fields followed by dense sections of woods at the foot of the Blue Ridge Mountains. You can hike up from the backyard to the Appalachian Trail, which I often did. Because of how old the house was, it came with a big book telling its story. Lots of history there, but I'll let you know about one thing that happened there in particular. During the Civil War, right past the wood line, a local militia got into a 45-minute skirmish with Iroquois Native Americans from Delaware, traveling through the area. As a result, 17 natives and 8 militiamen were killed in that backyard. 
If you want to know more, look up the Balcony Downs Massacre. You'll understand why this is relevant in just a few minutes. I was sleeping in my cousin's room with whom I am very close. She was asleep in another room that night with my younger sister. Her room was the slave room. This was a very old plantation home and at one time they unfortunately owned slaves. The room is square and it's the only room between the bottom and top floor. There was a small wooden spiral staircase going up into the room in the corner across from where I was sleeping and in front of the bed was a three or four step staircase going to the top floor. Her bed was in the back right corner if you were standing on those stairs and the spiral staircase was in the tight left corner about 10 feet over. I was 12 years old at the time so I always saw things that looked like figures and they always ended up being a towel or something different. Finally, because of my previous experiences, I turned my flashlight on, and what I saw made my heart drop. I saw what looked like a little Native American girl, in a long dress, with very long, straight black hair. She was standing there, not moving, just observing me. This scared me so bad, I just hid under my covers, too terrified to yell for anyone. I was afraid doing so would anger her or something. I remember looking up what to do if you see a ghost while under blankets. I was petrified. There was no other way to put it. I don't think I've ever been so afraid in my entire life. After about an hour, I eventually did fall asleep from exhaustion, but only for a little while. When I awoke again, I decided to peep out of my covers and check again. And there she was, in the same place still staring at me. I then took a picture of her, but my phone screen showed no one or anything in that spot. This confirmed to me that she had to be a spirit. I hid under my covers until morning. She was gone once the sun appeared. I talked to my cousin shortly after, saying I saw a ghost in her room. She then asked which one I had seen, describing the exact girl to me, and then she described a tall black figure who stood at the foot of her bed. She told me that most nights she sees them, but I was the first to see one other than her. I asked why she didn't move rooms and why she stayed there. And she did eventually, but she said that she'd just gotten used to it. I asked her about this over Snapchat the other day, and she said, yeah, that house is definitely off and I'm never going back there again. The PCT Can't Be Tamed by Hillary Y. I couldn't believe my luck when I finally set foot on the legendary Pacific Crest Trail. The idea of hiking through the breathtaking wilderness and experiencing the majesty of nature firsthand has always appealed to me. With my backpack securely fastened and a sense of adventure pulsing through my veins, I eagerly embarked on the journey of a lifetime. The first few days were a dream come true. The sun shone brightly overhead casting its warm rays on the rugged terrain. The scenery was awe-inspiring, with towering mountains, lush forest, and crystal lakes. I reveled in the solitude, relishing every step along the winding trail. But as often is the case with the great outdoors, the weather can change in an instant. On the fourth day of my hike, ominous gray clouds gathered above, obscuring the once brilliant blue sky. A chilly wind cut through my layers, causing me to shiver involuntarily. The atmosphere seemed to hold its breath as if anticipating something dreadful. I consulted my map and realized I had several miles before reaching the next campsite. Determined to push forward, I tightened the straps on my backpack and marched on, hoping to find shelter before the storm hit full force. Minutes turned into hours as I pressed on, the weather growing increasingly more hostile. The wind howled through the tall pines bending them at precarious angles. Fat and heavy raindrops began to fall, creating a dissonant symphony as they pelted against the leaves in my rain jacket. Once a well-defined and easy-to-follow trail, it quickly became muddy, making every step a struggle. My boots sank deep into the muck, making progress slow and exhausting. As the light faded, I felt a rising sense of urgency. I needed to find a haven before darkness swallowed me whole. Just when my spirits were at their lowest, I caught sight of a dilapidated cabin nestled between the trees. Its windows were cracked and the wooden boards looked weathered and worn. Though, the place seemed abandoned. It offered the promise of a shelter from the raging storm. 
With renewed hope, I quickly reached the cabin's doorstep, pushing open the creaking door. I stepped into a room frozen in time. The air was thick with the scent of decay, and the flickering light of my flashlight cast eerie shadows on the decaying furniture. It was clear that no one had set foot in this place for quite some time, many years if I had to guess. As I explored further, my heart skipped when I discovered a handwritten note on a dusty table. The message, barely legible, spoke of a curse that befell those who sought refuge in this forsaken cabin. It said of a hateful and vengeful entity that roamed the woods preying on lost souls. Goosebumps prickled on my arms, and a chill ran down my spine. Was this a tale to deter trespassers, or was this just some stupid thing kids did? Or was there actually something sinister lurking outside? I peered through the broken window, straining beyond the darkness, not seeing much. Suddenly, a bone-chilling wail pierced the air, causing me to stumble backward in fear. The sound echoed through the cabin, reverberating in my ears. Panic surged within me as I realized the storm had summoned a creature of nightmares. With every ounce of courage, I gripped my hiking poles and desperately ran for safety. The wind whipped at my face, rain blinding my vision as I sprinted through the treacherous forest. The creature's haunting cries pursuing me, branches tore at my clothing, my legs burned with exertion. In the distance, I caught a glimmer of light signaling the campsite I had longed to reach. With determination, I poured every ounce of every bit of energy I had into getting to that haven. Finally, I burst into the clearing, panting and drenched to the bone. Other hikers gathered around, their faces etched with concern as they saw me dragging myself in my bedraggled state. They offered comfort and warmth, sharing their tents and provisions. As the storm raged on outside, we huddled together, finding solace in each other's presence. Days passed before the storm finally abated, allowing us to continue our journey along the Pacific Crest Trail. The experience forever changed me, though reminding me of the unforgiving power of nature and the strength of the human spirit. As I recount the harrowing tale of my survival, I urge future hikers to approach the trail with respect and caution, for within its vast beauty lies the potential of unimaginable horrors, waiting to test the limits of your resolve. The Michigan Dogman is Real by Anonymous I had always been drawn to the mystique and allure of the great outdoors, so when the opportunity arose for a day hike in the picturesque forest of Michigan with my friends, I couldn't resist. Little did I know, though, that this adventure would turn into a horrifying encounter with the legendary Michigan Dogman. The day began with clear skies and a gentle breeze rustling through the leaves. I arrived at the trailhead early, excited to embark on my solo hike. Eventually, I would meet up with my friends at the end and we would have a little shindig. The trail meandered through dense forest carpeted with a vibrant tapestry of fallen leaves. As I set off, the scent of pine filled the air and the chorus of birds serenaded my steps. With each passing mile, the wilderness grew thicker around me. The sunlight struggled to penetrate through the dense canopy, casting eerie shadows that danced along the forest floor. Yet an unexplainable sense of unease began to creep over me, as if the very existence, the very essence of the woods were whispering a cautionary tale. Ignoring my mounting trepidation, I pressed forward, determined to conquer my fear. But as the hours wore on, the atmosphere grew increasingly oppressive. The forest silence was deafening, broken by the occasional stab of twigs underfoot. Every rustle, and hushed whisper of wind seemed to echo with an unseen presence. A peculiar smell invaded my nostrils as I rounded a bend in the trail. It was a potent blend of wet fur and decaying leaves, tinged with a metallic tang. My heart quickened, and a chill ran down my spine. My scent screamed danger, but curiosity compelled me to investigate further. Branches crackled nearby, causing my pulse to race. I turned slowly, scanning the forest with my eyes, and there it stood, bathed in dappled sunlight, a creature unlike anything I had ever seen in my lifetime. Towering on two legs covered in matted fur, 
It resembled a monstrous hybrid of a man and a beast. The creature's yellow eyes locked with mine, radiating a malevolence that chilled me to the core. Its snout curled with a sinister grin, revealing rows of gleaming, razor-sharp teeth. Fear paralyzed me as the realization dawned. I had come face to face with the infamous Dogman. At the time, it felt like time stood still. I was standing there in some sort of standoff with this thing, like a macabre survival dance, if you will. Every fiber of my being screamed at me to flee and run as far as fast as possible. But I knew deep down that escape was futile. The Dogman's predatory gaze left no doubt that I was its prey. Suddenly, with lightning speed, the creature lunged towards me, claws outstretched, its bellowing growl piercing the forest silence. Instinct kicked in and I dodged its initial attack, stumbling backward desperately for my life. But this dogman, this whatever, was relentless, its pursuit fueled by an insatiable hunger for flesh. The chase was relentless. Through tangled underbrush and fallen logs, my heart pounded in my chest each breath a gasp of terror. Panic set in as the realization dawned on me. I was lost in this nightmarish forest, a pawn in this dogman's sadistic game. Just as exhaustion threatened to consume me, a glimmer of hope emerged. I stumbled upon a dilapidated cabin, barely standing amidst the wilderness, but enough protection to where I could probably figure something out. It was my last chance, a potential sanctuary against the dogman's relentless pursuit. With adrenaline, I threw myself inside, slamming the door shut behind me. The ancient wood creaked under the weight of my desperate refuge, damn near breaking every step I took. I held my breath, praying that the creature would not find me. Hours passed, each minute feeling like an eternity. The sound of the forest faded, replaced by an oppressive silence. The air inside the cabin grew heavy, the smell of damp wood and fear lingering, but there was no sign of the dogman. At least, not for now. As the night wore on, the sky outside grew dark, the moon casting an ethereal glow through the cabin's cracked windows. Fear consumed me, and exhaustion finally took hold. Sleep beckoned, and its embrace, a temporary respite from the horrors that awaited outside, took me. Eventually, I woke up outside, the sun bathed the cabin in a soft golden light. My heart raced as I gathered the courage to venture out. I opened the door with trembling hands, bracing myself for the worst. But there was no trace of the dogman. The forest stood silent and still as if it had swallowed the horrors of the previous day. I stumbled back onto the trail, my body battered and soul scarred. As I returned to civilization, the weight of the encounter settled upon me. The Michigan Dogman was no longer a legend, but a chilling reality etched into the depths of my being. I had survived the encounter, but I knew that the memory of that haunting day would forever haunt my dreams, a constant reminder of the terrors that lurk within the heart of the woods. Always be aware of your surroundings. By Walt J. In the depths of my high school years, I actively participated in the basketball team and track events. To maintain my stamina, I frequented an 11-mile hiking trail that meandered through the ominous hills looming outside my small, seemingly safe town, where everyone knew everyone. Although not entirely secluded, the path possessed an uncanny ambience especially in specific stretches deep into the heart of these foreboding woods. There, the path became treacherously rugged, with patches of dirt and mud tangled with gnarled tree roots that sprawled like malevolent serpents in every direction. The challenge enticed me, forcing me to focus on each precarious step, oblivious to the energy I exerted. For three uneventful years, the trail remained a familiar and secure escape. That is, until the fateful day when literal and figurative darkness descended upon me. Like countless times before, I parked my car on the lonely dirt road, a humble offshoot of the ever-present highway. I indulged in a brief interlude smoking a joint to ease my mind while meticulously selecting a playlist on my phone. With earphones in place and a fresh piece of gum to invigorate my senses, I embarked on the trail. Strangely, 
I was trying to remember encountering anyone that day. Although it was afternoon, and typical for the course to be sparsely populated compared to the busier evening hours, several minutes passed as I treaded the initial crushed stone path. Once I reached a certain point, the trail transformed into an untamed wilderness. An unsettling change washed over me at this most isolated segment midpoint. Without any discernible reason, an overwhelming sense of dread began to gnaw my insides, its icy tendrils squeezing at my core. Nevertheless, I pressed on, attempting to dismiss the foreboding emotions that clung to me like a shadow. As the tail grew steeper, demanding I slow my jog to a cautious walk, I removed my earphones while maintaining a steady pace. In this moment of silence, I became acutely aware of the eerie absence of sound. A haunting stillness enveloped the surroundings, further fueling unease that coursed through my veins. Yet I remained oblivious to the lurking predator that had infiltrated my sanctuary, its presence unknown to my conscious mind. Although the dense woods that have concealed the potential threats of wild animals such as coyotes or even bears, though unlikely, the inexplicable fear gripping me transcended the realm of natural predators. A peculiar 30-second interlude nestled amidst the labyrinth recesses of my memory, presenting itself as an incomplete nightmare, blurry and indistinct. My recollection centered on a figure concealed within the trees. It was neither animal nor apparition, but unmistakably human. A man, a presence if you will. Struggling to visualize the faceless specter, I instinctively averted my gaze, keen on ensuring my obliviousness to its scrutiny. The response was almost involuntary, driven by a primal intuition that lingered deep within my psyche. However, this figure did not trail behind me as I initially thought it would. It stood ahead off to my right at a two o'clock angle. Frozen in place, it remained utterly motionless, silently observing my passage. Though I forged ahead, the tension in the air was palpable. Every nerve in my body screamed for escape. And then, upon rounding a bend approximately 15 feet beyond the figure, I succumbed to an animalistic instinct, an explosion of adrenaline that propelled me forward as if I was possessed. My knees quivered beneath the weight of my sprint, but the fear-driven momentum propelled me faster than I had ever thought possible. Though the haunting whispers of impending footsteps failed to reach my ears, it felt as if they were but a hair's breadth away, eager to seize me, their prey. It was a pure, primal terror that coursed through me, defying all rationality. I did not cease my frenzied sprint until the trees relinquished their grip, allowing me to look at the reassuring sight of my car. In the safety of its familiar presence, I finally halted, panting heavily, my body trembling. Despite the adrenaline-fueled chaos that had consumed me, I found no pursuer emerging from the darkness. It seemed as if the evil presence had evaporated, leaving me only with my racing thoughts and the unshakable conviction that someone, or something, had been there lurking amidst the foliage, their intentions far from benevolent. Perhaps they had merely waited for the right moment to pounce, and I inadvertently stumbled upon their evil plot. It may be tempting to dismiss this as a chilling encounter, or maybe some delusions of a stoned teenager wandering the woods alone. Yet I had followed that same routine for years engaging in my pre-run rituals, intoxicated or not. No, this was an experience that defied explanation or rationalization. And while I eventually bid farewell to that town, the haunting memory of that day still lingers in my mind, tainting any future attempts to retrace my steps. That peculiar sense of dread remained dormant, ever-present, casting doubt upon the safety of the familiar trails. And at this point, I'm way too scared to go back and traverse it. I wonder if any other people who hiked those trails have ever had experiences like this. I never really thought to ask because I didn't want people to think I was crazy. Fred Zalaker, Mount Clark Hiking Incident Fred Zalaker is known for his achievements in running and climbing including winning races on all seven continents. He has traveled to 137 countries and climbed over 185 mountains. Fred moved from San Francisco to Reno in 1984 and has remained there due to his love for the hills. He is six feet tall, weighing 150 pounds with gray hair and blue eyes. At the time of his disappearance, he was reportedly wearing a yellow shirt and khaki shorts. 
Fred had gone on a day hike on an off-trail route on Saturday but failed to return as planned. His disappearance was reported on Sunday. Fred was known for his fearless nature and had climbed mountains worldwide, often taking on technical challenges and leading his climbing partners. He was well known in competitive running and mountain climbing circles. Fred's death has led to an outpouring of tributes from those who admired his accomplishments. He set records in his age group, including winning his age group in all six Abbott World Marathon majors and completing marathons on every continent, including Antarctica. He has also summited several famous mountains, including Denali, Kilimanjaro, and Elbrus. Fred's website documented his adventures and showcased his achievements through photographs and lists of countries he had visited. He was described as a very adventurous person who would set and pursue goals with determination. The circumstances surrounding Fred Zalikar's ascent of Mount Clark and his final movements are honestly still under investigation by park authorities, and more details may emerge as the investigation progresses, but it's unlikely. The story is another sad reminder that Mother Nature is unpredictable, and you never know when your last day may be. I indeed extend my sympathies to Fred and his family. If anyone listening to this episode has a case they would like to see covered on the show, please feel free to comment below. Multiple Creatures in the Woods by Connor P. Late one night, my buddy and I went back to smoke a bowl. This was back before it was legal in Colorado, so you still had to be kind of sneaky about it. Anyway, we went out into the backyard and sat down. We hadn't even smoked yet, and suddenly we saw the gate leading out to the alley open up and some sort of little creature... Like that elf from the movie Harry Potter met Gollum from the Lord of the Rings, but somehow more realistic if that makes any sense. It had a cloak or some sort of covering on, but I couldn't be sure as when I looked up, it saw us. And as quickly as it had opened the gate, it had almost vanished. It was almost unhuman how quickly it withdrew itself back into the alley and silently shut the gate. Not the most extended encounter, but it shows that there's more than meets the eye out here even in the big city. This next story happens when I was hiking in the backwoods of Ohio, taking a nature walk, if you will. Weed was not legal in Ohio at all. I don't even know if it is now, but you used to have to hike 10 miles out into the bush if you wanted to get away with puffing the old devil's lettuce. Anyway, I had just sparked a, a fat one, and I was enjoying the natural sights and sounds when I heard something back in the woods behind me. I turned around to see what I can only describe as a 15-foot figure swoop from behind one tree to another. I almost shat myself at first, but after just a moment, I thought that maybe, just maybe my eyes were playing tricks on me. Before returning to the creek, I briefly studied where I had seen the thing. I heard this thing again, almost like a high-pitched whooping whistling sound. I turned around and saw a very tall, slender creature practically bouncing from one tree to another, making that high-pitched whooping sound. I've seen pictures of Sasquatch, which are varying. Some are tall, thin, some are even, you know, massive in the sense of like being like a bodybuilder. But this one, this one was weird. It was not like a slender man per se, but it was almost like some sort of puppet wearing long, dark, dresses that made it look like it was wavy or something. I don't even know how to even explain it, but I got out of those woods as fast as I could, and I've never even seen anything remotely like that again. But if you're out there in those Ohio backwoods, definitely watch out because there's some strange and creepy things going on out there. Now I know people are going to question, 15, 20 feet, you must be exaggerating, but I swear, in the moment, it felt like this thing was towering over me. Appalachian Ghost on the Trail by Willow S. When I was younger, roughly around eight years old or so, I think I saw my first ghost. We were hiking in the Appalachian Mountains, backcountry camping. I was terrified about sleeping in the woods near the top of a mountain, but my mother said we would be fine. Animals are terrified of daddy, my mother said teasingly. Holding my mother's hand, I trusted her but was still nervous. 
We hiked up along the Appalachian Trail until my father decided it was time to settle down and set up camp. We found a nice clearing. The sun was beginning to set. I looked up at my mother to notice she was pale and her hand tightly clasped around mine. T Todd, can we set up somewhere different? My mother asked, still clutching my tiny hand. She wanted to avoid the vibe the woods were giving, and I sensed it too. I was afraid. My father shook his head. Honestly, babe, it's getting late. I'm not searching for firewood in the dark. I remember asking to go home, and the small clearing gave an ominous vibe. After eating some hot dogs and roasting some marshmallows, we crawled into the six-person tent my father had purchased. My father fell asleep in just a few minutes, but my mother and I could not sleep. Emma, are you asleep? I lifted my head. No, Mama. I'm scared. I can't sleep. Hush. It's fine. We're safe inside the tent. She comforted. I finally fell asleep and woke up in the early hours of the morning. I exited the tent and saw my mother meditating on the ground. She meditated every morning with a cup of Earl Grey tea. I came up to her and tapped her on the shoulder. Mama, can we take a walk? My mother opened her eyes and said, Sure, let's not go too far. I don't want Daddy to worry. We were hiking near our campsite when my mother suddenly stopped. I followed her gaze to see a hazy image of a man leaning against a birch tree, roughly 20 feet away from us. He was just a gray image, but he did not seem threatening, just calm and solemn. He lifted his head and looked in our direction. I rubbed my eyes and he dissipated in front of us. My mother just looked at me and I understood that that man was not threatening, just calm and a sad presence. After that, I don't think I've ever seen a ghost again in my life, but I will never forget him. The Abandoned Hut by JTFFF Four years ago, I was a sophomore in high school. I had not yet gotten my license, which is right around the time I started to partake in certain substances. And one of my friends in the neighborhood, we'll call him Kurt, knew of a creek about a mile and a half from my house, which would be an excellent smoke spot. But it was a bit of a hike to get there. It was well known that there were a few scattered structures in the woods here, such as a dozen or so concrete huts and old barrel fire pits and platform built in the two trees at some point, I'm not really sure what that's about, all within a dozen feet of each other. This is about a quarter mile into the woods and about a half mile from any road. We had been there dozens of times during the daytime, usually with more friends though. We lived in a rather nice suburban neighborhood, so it didn't seem too dangerous to us, not to mention nobody else had ever been spotted there before. It had become a pretty standard smoke spot for kids our age. We all just assumed it was an old abandoned homeless structure, but there were still legends passed around by other high schoolers claiming something sinister lurked there. Hooks for hands, serial murderers, inbred cannibals, typical campfire stories, that type of thing. The concrete hut was about seven foot by seven foot by five foot, and the ground had been dug out inside making the roof even taller. We had found improvised weapons, food cans, trash, etc. when we first discovered it two years prior. But since then, nothing of that nature really popped up. Just beer cans, roaches, and cigarette butts scattered around in the fire pit from neighborhood kids. The inside had scribbled stuff on it with Sharpie. It was covered with a tarp, and the whole thing smelled like pee. So none of us really went inside. As I mentioned, a lookout platform was built into a tree about 50 feet away. An improvised ladder of branches leads to the five foot by five foot platform about 20 feet off the ground. The wood was water damaged, so it was very hard to get up there. Back on track this particular October evening, Kurt and I left at about 6 p.m. hoping to get there before dark. We had several other smoke spots that were close to my house, but nothing quite matched the excitement and the charisma of the hut. We make our way through the neighborhood, through some backyards into a field, and finally pass through the tree line. Stones laid out across the creek allowed us to cross without getting wet. Right around the time we got there, the sun was almost entirely set and there was not much light coming through the trees. This was the first time either of us had been there at night. We hiked up the last 500 feet uphill, barely seeing the hut through the darkness. The atmosphere had us both uneasy and we talked with the quietest whisper possible. We didn't want to approach the structure, so we decided to smoke about 50 feet from the hut right on the edge of the bluff we had just climbed. I shifted a few feet over to get some more even footing before we started, and I felt my foot snag on a fishing line running about a foot off the ground tied to the tree next to me. 
A loud clang was made as the line yanked an empty metal bucket into metal scrap planted into the ground. It was a makeshift alarm. We hear someone moving down from the platform in the tree, about 20 feet away from us, and drop into the leaves below. We take off down the bluff, sliding on our asses and hitting trees. We still hear scurrying and grunting behind us. We get to the bottom and sprint through the creek. I trip on the loose rocks below me and fall into the cold water before bolting up and continuing to run. About a second later, we hear splashes behind us. At this point, we clear the tree line and are in a quarter of a mile of an open field. We sprint as fast as we can. Kurt and I are hurt and out of breath, and the person is catching up. We can hear them behind us breathing heavily and their loud footsteps growing closer and closer. We sprint through someone's backyard and listen to their dogs barking. We finally run into the middle of the street and a car slams on its brakes. Kurt and I screech to a halt to avoid the vehicle. We turn around to see somebody standing just outside of the floodlights of a nearby house before they turn around and run back toward the forest. We apologize to the driver, ditched the weed, and I called my sister to pick us up. We explained what happened, begged her not to tell my parents, and we have never returned to that creek again. Attacked on the local hiking trails by Anonymous This story takes place the summer of 2001 in a small town outside of Rhode Island, where I am from. I am a female, for reference, and I was about 20 years old that summer, in between my junior and senior years of college at the University of Rhode Island. I decided to stay on campus and take some classes so my senior year would be a little lighter and be a bit less stressful for me. So I rented out a cute little apartment with a few friends and we loved it. Like I said, we were in a small town outside of the city. There were a lot of other college students around and I enjoyed living so close to the beach in the summertime. My schedule was pretty open, so even though I was working and going to school part time, I had a lot of time to myself and loved the freedom I had to do whatever I wanted. I have always been into fitness and exercise, and one of my favorite things to do that summer was take my rollerblades to the local bike path and listen to music on my earbuds while I glided down the long straight path. Every day, I would drive to the bike path and park my car at the park close by the path and rollerblade the mile long path until it ended. Another park would begin actually right after this one ended. At that second park, I would sometimes rest on one of the benches and take a little break and drink some water before turning back and going back down that same path again and ending up at the original park where my car was. It's about a two mile go, and I did this about every day. It was fun and great exercise, right up until this incident I'm about to chronicle for you. On this particular morning, I slept in and was running a little bit late, getting ready for my daily workout. I could not find my earbuds anywhere. They were not where I normally left them on my kitchen counter, and after spending some time looking for them around the apartment without any luck, I just said screw it and decided to exercise without them. I get to the park and put my rollerblades on and start my first mile. It was a beautiful July morning, and I was enjoying myself when suddenly, unexplainably about halfway through the mile, something felt very wrong. There was just this gut feeling that something was off. The temperature was in the 80s, but I had goosebumps all up and down my arms and legs. The hair on the back of my neck was standing up, and I had an intense, sinking feeling of dread. I've always had a very strong intuition. I trust it with my life. I felt this feeling before in the past, and it has always served as a warning. But I kept on skating, becoming very aware of my surroundings as I did so. Fight or flight was kicking in, and I didn't even understand why. That was until I saw him. There was a man up ahead on the trail, off the side of the path. The first thing I realized was that he was taking steps backward off the path. He was trying to hide from me in a tree, but I could still see his face from a good distance away watching me, like a dead-eyed predator. He stood there with his hands in his front pockets, not moving at all. As I skated closer to him, the dread in my stomach grew. I noticed he was not wearing workout clothes. He had an oversized hoodie, jeans, and work boots, nothing you would wear if you were expecting to exercise. Now, I had to quickly make a choice. Do I stop and turn around and go the way I came from, possibly endangering my life by losing the speed and momentum I had gained, or do I keep skating past him and hope he doesn't rush me from the side, pushing me off the path? 
the fear I felt turned quickly to rage. Quick backstory on me. I am no stranger to violence and assault from men in my past. I thought, why should I live my life afraid? Why should I cater to these men who think they can just take what they want from me? Do they think I'm just going to keep taking it? I felt my hands ball up into fist, my jaw jet out in defiance, and I decided I was standing my ground. Something told me that as I passed him that I needed to remember everything about what he looked like. I noted his dark eyes and beard. I noted his plain blue baseball cap, his hoodie, his jeans and construction boots. I could tell you my nostrils were flared and my eyes were flashing anger, and I glared at him with an intensity that said, I see you there, and I'm ready to fight you if need be. We maintained eye contact for what felt like a long time, but could not have been more than just a few seconds. Then he actually broke eye contact, looked away from me, and I knew he had changed his mind at this point about whatever he was considering doing to me, but I was still not safe yet. I flew as fast as I could to the second park and got off the bike path. Now, I was in a tough position. My car was a mile away, as was my shoes and cell phone. I could not go back down that path again and risk passing him a second time. He might have moved, he might have been hiding in a better place waiting for me, knowing I would need to go down that path to get to my car again. So I took off my rollerblades and made my way over to the road that ran parallel to the path and walked the mile back to my car in my socks, carrying my skates. It probably looked a bit strange to the drivers that went by, and the walk seemed to take forever. Once I saw my car, I ran to it as fast as I could and locked myself in. I never went back there to rollerblade ever again. Unfortunately, the story doesn't just end there though. After this incident, I went on with the rest of my day. I went to class, I made lunch at my apartment, I got ready for work, and went to my closing shift where I work as a waitress. I returned to my apartment complex at around 10pm to find my neighbor yelling excitedly on his cell phone in the parking lot pacing and smoking a cigarette as he talked. He and his girlfriend lived upstairs from me. I didn't know them well, but they were friendly enough. She studied nursing and he was a business major. We had all hung out shortly after move-in day, drinking beers and smoking joints on their balcony, and I thought they were both pretty nice people. I parked my car and started walking towards the building just as he was hanging up from his cell phone. I nodded politely towards him and he offered a friendly greeting, something like, Hey, how's it going? Seeing his face closer now under the lights, I could tell he had been crying. He told me his girlfriend was in the hospital. She had been attacked and violated by a strange man, and was recovering from some various injuries. Most seriously, a head injury from smacking her head on the concrete. As he described to me what happened, I felt tears rising in my own eyes and it felt like I had been punched in the stomach. What I said to him next made his jaw drop. I said, Did that happen on the bike path? He incredulously said yes, and demanded to know how I knew that. I told him I knew who did it, and I explained what happened to me that morning. He immediately asked if I could talk to the police and give a description of the man. Because of the little voice in my head that told me I needed to remember everything about his appearance, I was able to give a full detailed description of this man to the police. For months after this incident, I checked the news to see if he was ever caught, but I never heard that he was. The girl he attacked did make a full recovery, and shortly after returning from the hospital, she and her parents showed up in a moving van and packed up all her things in her apartment. I never saw her again. For a long time after that, I felt a lot of guilt about what happened to her. I felt that somehow her fate was meant for me, but I skirted it and left it for someone else to suffer through. What did I do to ward off this attack? What did I do that she didn't? The last and most chilling piece of this story, though? The earbuds that I lost the morning of this incident, the ones I looked all over my apartment for and that I had decided to forego using that day because I didn't have the time to look, I found them the next day on the kitchen counter, exactly where they were supposed to be. I know for a fact they weren't there when I looked, and I cannot explain why they disappeared that morning. I know my roommate didn't take them. I can only suppose that my awareness of the situation was the thing that saved me in the end, and some higher power was looking out for me that day. A series of creepy events by some Aussie mates. My name is Adeline. I have three pretty scary experiences to share. 
I'll caveat this story by saying I think Australia is rather safe, and I think I've just been <laughs> extremely unlucky. The first experience happened 11 years ago. I was around 16 years old. I was a pretty wild child and had quite a grown-up figure for my age, as my friends and I liked to dress up. My friend and I wanted to sneak into some clubs. The legal age is 18 here in Australia, as they didn't used to check ages at the door that much. We would then get guys to buy us drinks or whatever, as they typically checked your age at the bar. We did this almost every single weekend for quite some time, and nothing really ever happened. Then, one night in the middle of winter, we had this guy buy us some vodkas, and I have no memory from that point forward. I barely remember his appearance. He seemed like an average guy in his early 20s. I woke up freezing and coughing. I don't have a great memory of this, but I remember my eyes stinging from dust or sand. My mouth was so dry and full of dirt, and I was so cold. The cold where it seems to pierce your bones. I had the worst headache I had ever had. I could barely move or open my eyes because of the pain. Eventually I was able to sit up. It was just before dawn and there was some light but not too much. I started to freak out when I realized I was not entirely buried. There was about an inch of dirt on top of me. I still had my dress on but no shoes. I couldn't think straight but I knew something terrible must have happened. I must have been kidnapped. From what I could tell, I was somewhere in a rural area, and it was like a grazing paddock. I saw a road about 400 meters away, and a few cars driving down it. It took me ages to walk to the road. I was incredibly dizzy and kept losing my balance and landing on my knees, which were now pretty much cut up and bleeding. When I finally reached the road, I flagged down a car. I was so thankful they stopped. It was a young woman, and she seemed pretty freaked out by this bloody dirty girl who had just stumbled onto the highway. She helped me into her passenger seat and draped her coat over me. At this point, I couldn't stop shivering, either from the cold or maybe I was just going into shock. She kept asking me questions like my name or what had happened, but I, I couldn't answer. After just a few minutes, I must have passed out again. I woke up some time later and the sun was now up. I could hear her talking on the phone with someone. She was saying how she had me. I was still unconscious, and she was close to the drop-off point, and she would wait for them. I freaked out. In my state, I thought she must have been taking me back to the kidnappers. I started screaming, which resulted in her crashing her car into a ditch. She stopped, opened the car door, and ran onto the road. She was trying to calm me down, but I was hysterical. Then, from a distance, I saw red and blue lights. It was the police and an ambulance. That's who she was talking to. About 20 minutes in the ambulance later, I became a little more coherent. They told me I had been reported missing last night, and about 9 hours ago, this is when they started looking for me. When my friend couldn't find me in the club, she phoned my parents, and when the club had closed, they found my wallet and coat. They immediately acted on the missing persons report, as I was still a minor. The working theory is that I was drugged at the club and taken away. The doctors found no evidence that I had been interfered with. They thought maybe I had overdosed on a drug, or maybe the guy thought he had killed me or something. He must have freaked out and tried to quote-unquote hide the body. They think I laid in the shallow grave for most of the night. I'll never know exactly what happened, but the police opened an extensive investigation. I reviewed the security footage and sent round photos of the guy buying me a drink, but there was never any arrest. The scariest thing about this is that it started as just a regular night. Strange Experiences as a Travel Influencer by some Aussie mate. My friend Jess is an Australian travel influencer. She and her boyfriend travel around Australia in a van and share great beach locations, restaurants, clothes, etc. They earn pretty good money for it, enough to keep them on a perpetual holiday. This one time, they were on a deserted beach in the Northern Territory, and technically they were trespassing, as this was native land, and you weren't allowed to just use it. They said it was stunning, and they were taking loads of photos, bikini photos, etc., and they were pleased with their content. After about two hours, a bunch of Aboriginal kids turned up, four boys. When I say kids, they were between 10 and 14. They called my friend a few names and told them they weren't allowed here. Jess and her boyfriend got the message and started packing up their things. 
Unfortunately, Jess and I laid out a photo shoot worthy picnic, so packing took a little while. They noticed the kids found a goanna, a relatively sizable Australian lizard, and were proceeding to kill it by whacking it against a rock. Jess didn't want to be judged, as she knew aboriginals were allowed to hunt and kill native animals, but the violence unsettled both her and her boyfriend. Jess thinks the kids were trying to show off to her. After all, she was a glamorous girl in a tiny bikini. Jess then said she had the strangest experience of her life. She said all the sounds were just turned off and the wind died. The kids noticed it too. Jess then said she heard murmurs from the trees just past the beach, like people were talking to each other, and it sounded angry. Jess and her boyfriend scanned the tree line to see who was coming. They didn't want to get into trouble for being on native land. At first, they didn't see anything, except something was moving, as she glimpses of it, like a human. But Jess thought it was too tall for a human, and too pale. Most of the people out here were aboriginal, and these figures were pale. Like, strangely white, Jess couldn't be sure of what they were. Every time she went to focus on one, it was gone. It was like they were always just out of direct sight. She couldn't say what they looked like because she never got a good look. But she could tell there were at least ten, maybe more. The kids started to panic and called out that the mimics were there to punish them for disrespecting the goanna. The murmurs were still impossible to make out, but were louder and more angry than before. Jess said she'd only had this feeling once before, and that's when she scuba dived with a tiger shark. The feeling like she was prey. Everything in her body screamed she was in danger and needed to leave. Jess and her boyfriend jumped into the car and were about to leave, but the kids ran up to them, screaming. Despite her boyfriend's objections, Jess let them into the car, and they all piled into the back seat and pleaded for them to drive, but to leave. They had to go along the road through the trees, right where the figures were. Her boyfriend drove down the dirt road quickly without breaking the car. Jess scanned the trees as they went through them. She saw nothing. Just the typical bushland you would expect. When they eventually joined the main road, they let the boys out. She offered to drive them to their homes, but they said they would walk. Later, Jess looked up what a Mimi was supposed to be. They are ancient spirits in Australia, who first taught aboriginals how to hunt and use fire. There are loads of old cave paintings of them. They are supposed to be tall and thin and stay hidden in the bushland. They are supposed to be calm but are known to get upset when intruders are on their land, or someone kills or injures one of their pets. Jess and her boyfriend don't believe in anything supernatural, and are atheists, but this experience made them wonder if there are things out there that we don't fully understand. Jess's next story converted her from a non-believer to someone open to the supernatural. She and her boyfriend were checking into a hotel in a small country town during their travels. Their van toilet was broken, and they just needed a rest from van life, or at least that's what her boyfriend told her. This place was just more excellent than what they usually could afford. It was a beautiful old homestead. While waiting in line to check in, she started talking to another waiting guest. The guy casually asked if they were ghost hunters too. She quickly asked why, and the other guest explained that this was one of the most haunted places in the state. He told her there were supposed to be multiple ghosts, including an old man a young woman, and shadow figures of kids in the mirrors and glass. Jess's face must have shown some concern, but the concierge intervened and told her, there is nothing here that can hurt you, and if you do see something, just ignore it. And he said it with a smile and wink, so she couldn't tell if he was joking or not. Later that night, her boyfriend proposed while enjoying a fantastic meal in the hotel restaurant. It was an incredible moment and took her by surprise. She cried in joy and said yes, in true influencer fashion. She wanted photos to document the occasion. So, she went to the bathroom to fix her makeup. While touching up her face, she saw a blur behind in her mirror. She turned her head, thinking someone else must be in the bathroom, but it was only her. She looked back in the mirror and saw a shadow lurking in the cubicle. She looked behind her, and there was nothing. She leaned forward and studied the mirror. She could see it. There was a precise shadow figure hovering in the cubicle. She wasn't scared. As she remembered the words that they couldn't hurt her, it became clear to her that it only existed in the mirror's reflection and not on her side. It seemed to sense her lack of fear. Its movements became jerky, as though it was angry, 
and it rushed out of the cubicle. Jess didn't move though, and she continued to do her makeup. The shadow seemed to be angrier and angry at her lack of reaction. It now stood directly behind her, in the reflection in the mirror, and tried to claw at her. She felt nothing, though, and she wouldn't let some shadow ruin her night. When she was done, she turned around without hesitation, and there was nothing behind her, and she returned to the restaurant. She said she wasn't going to let a shadow ruin her night. My friend Luke has a couple of strange events. Now, Luke is a doctor and doesn't believe in anything supernatural, but he has these events that even he has to confess. There are no explanations. The first happened when he was 19 and still living at home. It was almost midnight. His parents were asleep and his younger brother was out. He walked past his brother's room and was surprised to see the neon blue glow of his gaming computer. His brother was a huge gamer. He never leaves it on when he's out. Luke entered the room to see if his brother was home, but the space was empty and untouched. He suddenly wanted to call his brother, something he never usually did. But tonight, he did. His brother had been in a fight, was scared, and needed a lift home. He didn't want to call his family because he feared getting in trouble. Luke said he would be there soon and pick him up. When he looked up, the computer was off. Luke found this so strange he even touched the computer. It was cold like it had never been on. Another time when he was working at the hospital, he was doing his rounds. A middle-aged man there had just moved out of home care due to a nasty infection that needed to be treated in the hospital. He had cancer and hadn't responded well to treatment. And while he was terminal, they expected he had another six months or so to live. He went to check on him before leaving for the evening and was surprised to see he had a visitor, a middle-aged woman holding his hand. Luke was surprised for a few reasons. One, it was way past visiting hours, and also, Luke had been told he had no living family, and due to COVID, only immediate family were allowed visitation rights. The man introduced the woman as his sister, and the woman just smiled. Luke said goodnight, and the man said, I'm glad I saw you tonight. I wanted to say goodbye. Luke laughed and said he will be back tomorrow to check on him. That man died unexpectedly that night, and none of the nurses or doctors remembered him having a visitor. My Creature Encounter by Zoomstar43 I live in a rural town in Australia, and I'm used to seeing kangaroos and hares when I walk alone. This was on a Saturday, and I went for a walk on this trail that I had found. It was roughly 30 or 40 minutes away from my house. The trail follows a bike track till you reach a fork in the path. If you leave, you end up back at the beginning of the way. If you head right, you follow this very narrow trail. You can barely fit two people walking side by side on it. So I continue down this track, and usually I hear birds chirping and just general wildlife noises. Still, I couldn't hear a single noise but the wind blowing in the trees around me and the crunching of gravel under my shoes. So I continued my walk for about 10 or 20 minutes. When I started to pick up on the leaves crunching behind me as if someone was trying to follow me without being heard. They were trailing me, and I thought nothing of it at first, so I kept walking for just some time before I heard a massive tree crack. It was as if somebody or something had stepped on a large tree branch and broke it in half. This caused me to stop and jump back as I started scanning the tree line for whatever made that loud noise. I noticed I saw a large black figure duck behind a few trees. They were only about 100 to 200 meters away from me. Now I knew this wasn't a kangaroo by the size of the figure. It's hard to describe, but I will do my best. It was like a six foot human, but its arms were abnormally long. They stretched down from its shoulder to the ground, and its head was tilted nearly 90 degrees sideways, almost as if it wasn't connected to its body. As I saw this figure duck behind the thick trees and shrubs, I stood there staring at where I last saw the figure. What scared me? and is engraved in my mind was its eyes peeking through the bushes, those dark red eyes that felt like they were staring into my soul. I felt helpless, 
I felt like prey. I felt like this was an apex predator. When I saw this, my whole body became fearful. All my joints started shaking, and this eerie fear washed over me as my body ran before my brain could even comprehend what I had just seen. As I was sprinting away, I could hear leaves and branches cracking loudly as if I was getting chased by something significant and fast. I never looked back as I was chased for what seemed like ages, my blood coursing through my veins and my adrenaline at an all-time high. That's when I heard the most high-pitched screeching sound that I've ever heard in my life. I didn't even know vocal cords could even remotely make these sounds. I immediately dove behind a big mound of dirt out of complete fear. I sat there trying to restrain my breathing as to not give away my position. I heard the sound of leaves cracking and coming from the other side of the dirt mound. I sat there holding my breath when I heard this thing bolt past me at such an incredible speed that I was shocked that it didn't catch me earlier. It started getting dark as I sat there for what seemed like hours. I was waiting for this thing to return at any moment. Finally, I knew I had to move or otherwise I would be here in the pitch black and I would have to use my phone flashlight to navigate. And with that thing looking around, I knew I would be a dead man. So I nervously got up and sprinted back to town. The rest of the day was seemingly normal, and I have never heard or seen anything like that ever again. But I still refuse to go down that trail, as I've never been that fearful for my life, and I'm grateful that I hid in that fork in the road, because I would not be typing this here today. Urban Exploration Gone Wrong by Accomplished Mix For a bit of background, I live in South Australia and I am 17 years old. I have always been interested in exploring abandoned buildings, so for my birthday, I decided to meet up with a friend that I met on TikTok that goes urban exploring. I'll call him Jack. To set the scene, it was a slightly warm day in Adelaide. My friend Chris and I caught a bus to town and met Jack at a bookstore. After hanging out for some time roller skating in an empty car park, we explored an abandoned gallery seven or nine stories tall. I forgot the exact number. Jack crawled through a tiny vent to unlock the doors, and Chris and I waited for him. After gaining entrance, we explored the building 30 minutes from top to bottom. Everything was going well when we encountered this large red stain on one of the floors. It was still wet with a few cigarette butts left roughly in the center of the paint. All three of us agreed that the color was very suspicious and looked like blood, but we couldn't tell if it was blood or paint. At one point, Chris and I were at the center of the floor, looking down at this mezzanine or indoor balcony. Jack was trying to pry a door open to my left about eight meters away. Suddenly, he let out a scream and dropped his torch. I looked up trying to figure out what had scared him, I thought that maybe he had seen a giant spider or something dumb. After staring at the door for quite a few seconds, I saw a hand squeezing through the hole where the doorknob would have been. My friends and I quickly regrouped and walked away from the door, right where the stain that looked like blood was. A few seconds later, the hand's owner started walking rapidly toward us. As three teenagers, we all felt just a little bit nervous. The hand's owner was an older male in his 30s, maybe more significant than us in size. Nevertheless, Jack remained calm and started having a conversation with the man. The older male told us that he was from Melbourne, had been drinking with some friends in a band, and stayed there overnight. He then noticed the stain on the ground, and that is where things get a bit weird. He told us that his friends had removed the body and demanded that we were not to tell anyone. We all collectively agreed not to tell anyone, and we were feeling properly weirded out by this point so I pulled out my pocket knife, keeping it behind me just in case. The man did eventually leave us alone, and so we got out of there. After a couple of months, probably somewhere around February 2023 to be exact, Jack and I met up again and ended up exploring that same building. The stain was still there, but this time it looked like somebody had poured another liquid on top of it to try to clean it. They did a half-assed job. Nothing weird happened during that exploration except for an alarm that Jack did not set off or myself set off going off by itself. There was a mutual feeling that somebody else had been in that building, but it's hard to say for sure. D. 
Disappearing in wilderness areas can particularly be a challenging thing for search and rescue teams due to the rugged terrain and limited communication options. Despite the thorough search conducted by volunteers and professionals, no trace of these people are ever really found, and very rarely are any of their belongings discovered. In cases like this where a person goes missing in a remote area without apparent whereabouts, it becomes difficult to determine what might have actually happened. There are various possibilities including accidents, getting lost, encountering wildlife, and experiencing a medical emergency. This is what we call the missing 411 phenomena. It's really hard to pinpoint exactly what's happening to these people. It's important to note that wilderness environments can be unpredictable and even experienced backpackers can face unexpected challenges or accidents. Sometimes individuals who go missing in such areas are never found, leaving their disappearance a mystery. Now, this is where you'll see things like Bigfoot and aliens pop up, but to be respectful, we'll probably leave those out of today's episode. Before I jump into today's cases, I just wanted to take a moment to remind you guys to be sure to hit that like button as it helps me out a ton. The more likes this episode gets, the more YouTube promotes it. Be sure to subscribe if you're new. We are very close to 300,000 subscribers and it would be great to hit that sometime in the summer. And now, without further ado, let's jump right into these creepy and downright strange missing 411 horror stories that'll have you scratching your head tonight and have you looking over your shoulder next time you're in the woods. Bobby Bizzup, missing from Cabin Camp, St. Malo. The disappearance of Bobby Bizzup is a tragic and mysterious case. In 1958, 10-year-old Bobby Bizzup went fishing in Cabin Creek at Camp St. Malo, a Catholic's boys' camp. A counselor named Terry Cohen informed Bobby that it was time for dinner, and Bobby nodded to indicate that he understood. However, within an hour, the camp realized that Bobby was missing. Despite extensive search efforts by numerous counselors, Bobby could not be found. The camp's director, Reverend Richard Heister, notified Bobby's parents and a U.S. forest ranger station about the disappearance. Unfortunately, Bobby remained missing for over a year. In July 1959, Bozzy Bizzup's remains were discovered just below the timberline. Identification was made through scraps of clothing, bones, and fragments of a child's hearing aid, indicating that it was indeed Bobby's body because he did indeed use hearing aids. The circumstances surrounding his disappearance and subsequent death remained unclear at the time. In 2021, a skull believed to belong to Bobby Bizzup was turned over to federal authorities by a man named Dr. Tom McCloskey. Dr. McCloskey revealed that he had been in possession of the item via his father, Dr. Joseph McCloskey, who was a prominent member of the Catholic Church and a close friend of the priest running Camp St. Mallow when Bobby vanished. Dr. Tom McCloskey inherited the skull in 1980 after his father's death and upon seeing a documentary called Mystery on Mount Meeker, he decided to contact federal authorities. The documentary, Mystery on Mount Meeker, produced by WBIR's Nine Wants to Know, shed light on the case and raised questions about the sequence of events when Bobby disappeared. It revealed that three camp counselors went on to abuse children as priests, suggesting a disturbing connection. DNA testing on the skull is underway to determine if it does belong to Bobby Bizza. The investigation aims to uncover the truth about what happened to Bobby and potentially shed light on the circumstances surrounding his disappearance and death. It is a tragic and complex case to say the least, and without further information or the DNA testing results, it is truly difficult to answer what exactly happened to Bobby Bizza. The investigation and analysis of evidence will hopefully bring closure and answers to this long-standing mystery, and I will be sure to make an update video as soon as I see more information. Robert Bissell, Roaring River Wilderness Area on a fateful day in July 2010, 57-year-old Robert Bissell embarked on a solo camping trip to the remote Roaring River Wilderness area. 
Known as a seasoned backpacker and outdoor enthusiast, Bissell sought the tranquility and solitude of nature while indulging in his passion for fishing. Leaving his home in Portland, Oregon, he filed a wilderness use permit with the U.S. Forest Service, stating his expected return date of July 16th. Little did anyone know that this would be the last time Robert Bissell would ever be seen. Driving his white 1989 Nissan Sentra with Oregon license plates, Bissell parked at Trailhead 700 near Rock Lakes. From there, he hiked approximately five miles to establish his campsite off Trail 512 near Middle Rock Lake. Strangely, it appeared that he only intended to be away for a day or two as he left behind his sleeping bag and gear, taking only his fishing rod and tackle. Concern arose when Bissell's brother visited the campsite on July 19th and July 24th, finding no trace of him. The Clackamas County Sheriff search and rescue team was alerted and on the morning of July 25, 2010, an extensive search operation was launched. The search efforts encompassed the Roaring River Wilderness, Rock Lakes Basin, and the surrounding trail system and lakes including Serene Lake, Shining Lake, and Shell Rock Lake. Reports from fellow campers indicated that they had encountered Robber at the beginning of his trip, approximately 20 miles southeast of Estacada. Bissell had left a note detailing his itinerary, providing a glimpse into his plans and thought process. Searchers hypothesized that he had set up camp and then embarked on a day hike to fish in the Rock Lakes Basin area, given that his fishing gear was missing. The area was known for its abundant trout population, making it an ideal fishing spot. To aid in the search, flyers were distributed in campgrounds, trailheads, ranger stations, and the nearby town of Estacada, appealing for any information that could assist in locating Robert Bissell. Sergeant James Rhodes of the Clackamas County Search and Rescue Unit considered the possibility that Bissell may have sustained an injury during his trek in the challenging terrain of the Mount Hood National Forest. However, the relatively cool temperatures at the time were not expected to pose an immediate threat of hypothermia. Despite the deployment of hundreds of volunteers and 60 to 70 professional searchers, as well as the utilization of helicopters, search dogs, mounted horse patrols, and other resources, no sign of Robert Bissell was ever discovered. The search teams worked diligently, adhering to standard search and rescue procedures. They ventured into new areas, calling out and blowing whistles, hoping for a response that never came. Throughout the operation, various items thought to belong to Bissell were found, but none were able to be confirmed upon examination. In addition, other campers were interviewed, who had apparently interacted with Robert during his camp setup. Curiously, Bissell's clothing and fishing gear were never located. It was as if he had just vanished without a trace, leaving unanswered questions and a sense of mystery. The extensive search efforts were officially concluded on August 3rd, 2010, without indicating Robert Bissell's whereabouts. The rough and unforgiving terrain of the Mount Hood National Forest presented numerous challenges, even causing search horses to lose their shoes. Ronald Scott Gray, Selway Wilderness Region. Massachusetts hunter Ronald S. Gray vanished without a trace over seven years ago during a fall hunting expedition in the rugged Selway area of Idaho, near Kuskia. Despite an extensive month-long search by ground and air teams, the 62-year-old hunter from Essex County was never located. There seems to be a semblance of closure as Nancy Gray, his widow, recently petitioned the court to declare her missing husband legally deceased. A specific date for the hearing on the petition is yet to be determined. Ronald Gray, a retired Massachusetts State Police Major, was an enthusiastic outdoorsman and a former U.S. Marine combat veteran who had served in Vietnam. According to court records, his last communication was via radio on September 19, 2008, stating that he was at High Line Lakes and planned to return to his companion's Outfitters Camp at Outer Butte by September 23rd. It was common for Gray to embark on solo hunting trips for multiple days, occasionally surpassing his intended return date. When he failed to return by September 26th, his disappearance was reported to the Idaho County Sheriff's Office. 
The search efforts involved a collaboration between personnel from Idaho and Clearwater counties, Hillcrest Aviation, and the Idaho Army National Guard. Despite their combined efforts, no trace of Gray was ever discovered. However, a fanny pack containing some of his personal belongings was found at High Line Lake. The search spanned a vast and challenging terrain covering approximately 1,000 square miles, ranging in elevation from 2,000 to 7,000 feet. Unfortunately, the search had to be suspended on October 14th due to worsening weather conditions. The total cost of the search operation remains undisclosed, but the helicopter services alone amounted to around $20,000 with contributions of $1,975 made by the Gray family and friends. In an affidavit submitted to the district court in Grangeville, Nancy Gray expressed her profound shock at her husband's unexpected disappearance, stating, Ron has always been very upbeat and looking forward to the next adventure. She could never have foreseen that his hunting trip in Idaho in 2008 would mark his final endeavor. Nancy's petition to declare her husband legally deceased is handled by attorney Victoria Olds, based in Grangeville. You can find more information about this online or at The Charlie Project. Minami Shinomura Case takes us to Hirogano Kogen Campground in Gujo, Japan. With just under 40 acres, it's the largest campsite in Gujo, and it has beautiful bungalows, cottages, and even a mountain villa. A post made to the Unsolved Mysteries subreddit details the tragic case of Manami Shinomura, a 10-year-old girl who disappeared while on a school outing with multiple chaperones and 84 of her 5th grade classmates. She had expressed her excitement for the trip to her big sister, Akumi, just the night before. Manami was the youngest of her three sisters who were raised by their single mother, Masuyo, and I was unable to find many details about her father. By all accounts, Manami was a sweet girl with a bright, cheerful personality, who loved to sing and dance despite having endured many struggles in her short life. She was born with a heart condition that required surgery, and she had Down syndrome. Her poor health left her much smaller than the other children, and she required adult assistance with everyday tasks. That isn't to say she was lonely. Manami enjoyed going to school, and she had plenty of friends in her class. Her mother also stated she was very aware of her special needs and knew better than to wander off on her own, yet she never returned from her field trip. On July 23, 2009, the large group from Tokuname Nishi Elementary School arrived at the campground, where they planned to stay for three days. While there, the campsite was closed to the public, giving the children free reign to experience nature to its fullest during their outdoor classes. The first night went off without a hitch, but day two is when things took a tragic turn. Sometime between 7.30 and 8 on the morning of July 24th, the school principal witnessed Manami and four friends passing by on their way to preview some tests or demonstrations scheduled for later that evening. Different sources translate exactly what this activity was, but the principal noted that Manami was lagging behind the group. And though he found the site concerning, he chose not to follow. It was only a short time later when her friends returned without her, claiming she had vanished. The path they were on formed a loop. All you had to do was just simply follow it, and you would return to the starting point. But if she went off trail, danger lurked in practically every direction. There was a paved road nearby, the eastern slope had cliffs that even adults couldn't climb, and there was a stream to the west. It said the water was shallow at that time of year, but, as we all know, water doesn't have to be that deep for someone to drown. When teachers failed to locate Manami, the police were called and hundreds of volunteers came to assist in the search efforts. They were told to look for a little girl wearing a red name tag, light pink trousers, light blue athletic shoes, and a long-sleeved t-shirt with blue sleeves and a rabbit pictured on a white background. Her hair was in pigtails, and she was estimated to be about 3 foot 9. Unfortunately though, no trace of the little girl was ever found. There were no footprints, and none of her belongings have ever turned up. 
The lack of blood and fur quickly ruled out any sort of animal attack, and investigators were stumped as to how a small girl could go so far in such a little amount of time. When the official search efforts were officially called off, Manami's mother continued looking for her on her own for multiple months after. It's rumored a pair of shoes similar to her daughter's were found, but police determined they were not an exact match. The most popular theory behind the young girl's disappearance is that she simply fell behind the other classmates and wandered off into the wilderness. She wouldn't have been able to fend for herself in such a harsh environment, even if she avoided contact with wild animals altogether. The likelihood of finding safe food and water were practically non-existent. What I don't really understand is that if she was as frail as described, how did she wander off in the first place? Had she tried to venture off, or if the other children had dared her to do something dangerous, wouldn't she need to stop off and to rest? Yet, somehow she eluded hundreds of searchers. Is it possible someone snuck into the campground despite being closed to the public? Everyone knew that only students and teachers were allowed. If someone else were there, they would have needed to escape detention completely. Or, well, I sure would love to know more about that principal, Hiroki Sawada. What if he did follow little Minami when he saw her trailing behind her friends? There are simply too many questions and not enough answers, much like our next case. Saya Minami The disappearance I want to discuss took place in Matsudo, a city in Chiba Prefecture. Our focus is on seven-year-old first grader named Saya Manami. So, yeah, she coincidentally shares a name with the previous victim, but don't let it confuse you too much. On September 23rd of 2022, so very recently, Saya and her mother plan to visit a park near their home. They usually walk together, but on this particular Friday afternoon, Saya left the house alone with nothing but her pink scooter at 11.30. According to Japan Times, her mother followed behind her about five minutes later, but by then it was already far too late. Saya was nowhere to be found. Her height is estimated to be just over three and a half feet tall. She has short black hair, and she was last seen wearing a pale pink t-shirt, blue shorts, and pink sneakers. Japan is known for its low crime rate, especially against children. So the case quickly received national attention as volunteers poured over the streets in search for the missing girl. Security cameras showed her within 900 meters of the park that she intended to meet her mother at before surveillance footage lost sight of her. She was riding her scooter at the time, but later that day, the scooter was discovered in a different park in the neighboring city, Nagarayama. I felt this to be a strong indication of foul play which was only fueled further the next morning when her socks and shoes were found on the banks of the Edo River over 300 yards away from that park. Crimes against children are simply that uncommon in their society. What does it say about our own that a predator is our first and only assumption? Saya's parents had previously searched the area where her socks and shoes were found and they were certain the items were not there before. They could have been mistaken, of course, Air and water searches were also conducted and teachers from Saya's school helped canvas the area, but no further signs of the missing girl were ever discovered that day. On Monday, her principal explained the tragic news in a school assembly, and a few days later, Saya's hat was found over a half a mile further downstream from where her shoes had been found. The hat had her name on it, and her parents appealed to the public for any information regarding their missing daughter. Tragically, it wasn't long after that that everyone's worst fears were confirmed. Sources are unclear on when, but sometime around September 27th, a child's body was found in the Edo River. After a typhoon passed through central Japan, a cyclist discovered a small floating body and called the authorities. The discovery was made just over nine miles away from where Saya's socks and shoes were located. Obviously, investigators' first thoughts were of the little girl. Even their clothes were similar. But they waited for DNA confirmation before making the official announcement on October 4th. An autopsy concluded that most likely the cause of death was to be that of a drowning. No major injuries were visible, and her time of death was placed between one to two weeks prior. A memorial was started near the site where mourners were able to bring flowers and small gifts. Whether Saya was suspected of running off or kidnapped, 
remains unconfirmed by authorities, but it left the community too frightened to let their children go out alone for some time. It almost makes you wonder if those low crime statistics stem from the unwillingness to admit when certain cases have nefarious elements. Aside from her scooter somehow making it to an entirely different park, and the fact that her parents didn't initially see the clothing articles by the river, her parents also insist Saya hated getting her feet wet, and that she was not a big fan of water. She wouldn't have left her socks and shoes placed off to the side so neatly. Oh, and in case if you are wondering how Saya's mother could have let her walk to the park alone in the first place, again, it's really not that uncommon in Japan. Children even go shopping alone when the stores are close enough. Which, I mean, it's Japan, the stores are usually close enough. Matsudo City even boasts itself as one of the top places nationwide to raise a child. So this tragedy was particularly shocking for the residents. Close Call with the Pugwaji by Chase Hello Swamp Dweller, thank you for your content and keeping things creepy. Before I tell this story, I need to share a little bit of background information. I live in Massachusetts in an area known as the Bridgewater Triangle. It's like the Bermuda Triangle but on land, hence the name. It's a hot spot for the paranormal and the unexplained. Lots of UFO sightings too. But the story I'm going to tell you about is from what I think is some sort of cryptid that is a bit of an urban legend in the area. It's called a Pugwiji, meaning Person of the Wilderness. In Native American Wampanoag language, th there were so many sightings that the local police jokingly put up a sign on the side of the road near the forest within the triangle. The sign reads, The sign reads, Pugwiji Crossing, and contains a drawing of the creature. These cryptids have always been described as small, usually between two to three feet tall, resembling goblins. They are known to shapeshift into other things like orbs of light or different animals, but they always look a little off. Most commonly though, they look like a porcupine from the back. They can appear and disappear at will, apparently. I worked not too far from this forest, and the man I worked maintenance with lived by the train tracks that ran alongside of the woods. I went by his house one day and we sat around his table and talked about work and other things. He was an older man in his 50s and his roommate was around the same age. She was a severe woman who rarely cracked a smile and had a no bullshit personality. The three of us smoked and continued talking about nonsense when the forest was brought up and he shared some very creepy stories to say the least, but nothing compared to the level that his roommate shared. She had worked the local paper routes for years and would start around 2.30 a.m. She told me she pulled up to this house. She doesn't exactly remember where it is at this point because it was so long ago, but she pulled up to this house that she typically always delivered to at the time that had this big pine tree in the front yard off to the side near the wood line. At this point, it was around 3, 3.30 a.m., and she had only just really started the shift. She glanced over at the tree, and she noticed something standing next to it. She described it as a short creature no more than three feet tall with legs like a kangaroo and the face of a wolf with glowing red eye. She continued and said after that she went home for the day and as the week passed, terrible things started happening to her around her home and in her life. She claims the creature cursed her because she looked into its eyes and had to get a local Native American shaman to cleanse her property. After that, the bad luck seemed to vanish entirely and she could carry on with her life trying to forget the haunting image. After she told her story, I had a complete body reaction of goosebumps and my neck hair sticking up. If someone else told me the story, I would probably laugh and not believe them. I've always, I've always heard of Pugwidgey, and I was open to the idea, but I never saw one myself, so I couldn't exactly call myself a believer, if you know what I mean. But there was something in how she told me and looked at me, not to mention her personality. She had no reason to make it up, and I just believed her. Fast forward five, maybe even six months after I heard the story, I was visiting my girlfriend at the coffee shop where she worked and began talking to some daily customers. A few old guys in their late 60s, maybe even early 70s, would drink coffee and sit and share stories or talk politics. We started talking about hunting and fishing, and the same forest was brought up again. 
I asked the one man in particular if he had any creepy stories to share since he had often hunted in that forest, in the nighttime, the morning, even in the day. He gave me a very interesting but severe look and said, yes, and advised me not to explore there unless I had a gun. He shared a few creepy stories, but the last one he told me changed my opinion forever. He told me a few weeks before he was heading to Maine to meet up with a friend for a weekend of hunting. He was born north of the highway that runs alongside the forest. It was early morning and very dark out still. Suddenly, he noticed two creatures running across the street in front of his van. The first was going way too fast to be natural, but the second one he caught a good look at it. He described it as having the feet of a jackrabbit, the nose of some sort of dog, maybe, and glowing red eyes. He was unsure about the face. He told the creature precisely as the older woman had. I felt the familiar body reaction, hair raising chills and all that. I suppose at this point, if I had any doubt before, it was now completely gone. Although I've never seen a Pugwidgee for myself, I consider myself a believer. I hope I never run into one myself. There's so much unknown out there and it's probably best if we all keep an open mind. Thank you for sharing my story and stay safe out there. My Friend's Bigfoot Encounter by Connor P. A new friend I made recently told me this story after a couple of beers, without which I'm sure he wouldn't have told me. But as he related the following events, I had genuinely gotten the sense from him that he was being very earnest. The fear in his voice is very, very... It's very palpable, you know? It's different from when people are just making something up and then kind of just throwing out wild, you know, wives' tales at you. But I want to share this story from his perspective the best way I can. So, it will be from his point of view for the rest of the time. Growing up in Wyoming is, is basically to grow up hunting. At least for my family. We've hunted about everything you can legally pursue in this state and then some. I'm not necessarily proud of it, nor am I particularly remorseful either. I don't do it much anymore, but growing up, we'd always go out. A few of my friends claimed to see Bigfoot, but I always laughed it off, you know. I'd smelled some funky stuff out there, but I've never seen anything that I could say was Bigfoot. It's pretty hard to believe in something like that. But I tell you what, I wish, I wish it was Bigfoot that we saw on the night of 2018 when I was home and went hunting with my dad. We were hunting for elk with ATVs out in the Snowy Mountains range. So we'd gotten some elk urine and were bugling to attract a big bull. My dad had a thermal scope which I had used to scope out a ridgeline. My dad had walked down the ravine to flush something out my way. As I was looking through the scope, I saw something moving down the ridgeline toward us, from the opposite direction of where my dad had gone. At first I thought it was an elk due to the size of its antlers. Then I thought it was a moose because of its height, but I couldn't make out any fine details. The thing that threw me off, though, was that it wasn't moving like an elk or a moose. Its movement reminded me more of like a rodent, how it would have these quick little bursts of speed and then stop. Something about that, combined with the physical length of its front legs which appears shorter than its hind legs, was giving very weird, creepy vibes. It almost had like this curved slouch to it. With horror, I realized we were upwind from this apparition, and it could likely smell the elk urine we had so liberally applied to our clothes. This thing was hunting us. It was using the trees for cover, but I could see it had big antlers, and that's how I knew it was looking in my direction. That's when I started hearing this loud clicking sound, and this was going to s It was using the trees for cover, but I could see it had big antlers, and that's how I knew it was looking in my direction. That's when I started hearing this loud clicking sound, and this is going to sound crazy, but it sounded kind of like how the Predator sounds in the Predator movies with that creepy clicking sound it makes. At that moment, I became acutely aware of our position on the food chain and that feeling of peace and safety that had always been synonymous with being out in nature for me was gone in just a split second. I knew I had to make a move, or this thing would be soon on top of me. So I quickly got my stuff together and took off toward where my dad had gone. I intersected his path as he returned to my position and I quietly told him what I had seen. Trying to keep my fear in check, he looked confused and I could tell he didn't really believe me. Then. The clicking sound started back up once more. 
I scanned back toward the sound with the scope and I could still see it. I passed my dad the scope and pointed to where it was. He looked through the scope for quite a few seconds before looking back at me, and I could tell he was pretty shocked. We booked it down to our ATVs and drove back down to the truck and trailer. We loaded them up and left as quickly as possible. We never really talked about what we saw that night, but sometimes I would catch my dad staring off into the distance and I knew he was thinking about it. It boggled his mind seeing something like that after spending his whole life out in the woods, but he's never really been that type of guy to open up about his feelings, so I don't really know what he thinks about it. Sometimes I've convinced myself it was just a big old bull elk with some sort of deformity, but then again, elk don't make that type of sound. I don't know of anything that does except for that movie I mentioned. I can't speak for my dad, but I know I won't be going hunting out there anytime soon. Something in the Woods by Patrick Y. Dear Swamp Dweller, This is my story of how a Boy Scout camp went terribly wrong. I will not reveal the name of the place I went to for safety reasons, however, I will try my best to remember everything as I can. This happened only a few months ago, but I may need to retain some while dealing with other stuff. I don't think so, though. My scout troop and I camped at a Native American park in Texas. On the ride there, we told stories, argued about anything and everything, and typical Boy Scout stuff. I instantly felt uneasy and queasy as soon as I left the van we drove in. Not like I'm being watched feeling, but more like I feel deathly sick type feeling. We arrived at around 8 or 9 p.m., and since it was only March, it was already pitch black outside. The tall trees didn't really help much with that, and when we were done setting up tents and preparing for the weekend, it was already well after 10. We were tired and decided to build a fire on the first night. We took turns telling stories until it was Cole's turn. Cole was our senior patrol leader, which means he is the leader essentially, and we all follow him. He told the story that touched us all. We could tell he didn't really read this off the internet, and he later confirmed that the park ranger told him this story when he checked into the campsite. And the story went like this. There were two Native American tribes, Tribe A and Tribe B. Tribe A, of course, hated Tribe B and vice versa. However, there was a mutual tribe, Tribe C, and Tribe C hung around with Tribe A and Tribe B and tried to bring the two tribes together. One day, Tribe C vanished and left without a trace, seemingly disappearing out of thin air. Tribe A and Tribe B, a few generations later, somehow came together over this in some manner or another. A Gree man and his wife saw the land that the Native Americans had settled in. He wanted to build a cabin and live there with his li He wanted to build a cabin and live there with his wife. When he was making the cabin with it, the wife went to collect a pot of water so they could share that night and swear they saw the ghost of a Native American. Apparently, the spirit tried to warn her about the land and the dangers in the area. The wife immediately took action and told her husband. Her husband did not listen though. He continued building the cabin until one day it was finished. When the cabin was fully done, the wife felt she wanted to leave ASAP. She would go crazy and ask her husband every night that they should leave. One day, the husband went hunting. He had shot a deer and next to the deer dropped a bag of meat. It just appeared there after the deer was shot. So, the man took the deer and the bag of meat. When his wife cooked the beef, they noticed it smelled awful, like it was rotting. She cooked it up anyway for some reason, and the smell seemed to go away. They ate the meat and enjoyed it very much. The wife went crazy to find some more of that meat. The husband told her he hadn't known what happened when he shot the deer. Then the next day, the husband brought back that meat again. The wife cooked it up and enjoyed it once again. Soon that feeling of wanting to leave suddenly vanished. The beef had made her want to stay instead of going. Then one day while sleeping, they awoke to footsteps outside. The man went out with his gun and found nothing. They went back to sleep and the footsteps entered the cabin and they woke up again. The man went out again with his gun and found absolutely nothing. The footsteps then got right outside the door to their bedroom. The man got up again with his rifle and opened the door. Nothing. 
The following day, the couple was found dead on the cabin's roof, with substantial claw marks. Everyone went to bed after Cole told the story, except for Cole and myself. We decided walking around the campsite was a good idea to make those footsteps and scare the rest of the troop. Cole said he would wait in the tent for me to finish. I didn't think much of it, so I started. One, two, three. The first footsteps were made. Four, five, six. Some more footsteps were made. Then, my footsteps seemed to be echoing behind me. A rotting smell filled the air. I gagged as I continued forward. I walked some more. Then I realized that everything had suddenly gone deathly quiet. There was no more cacophony of insects and nighttime noise. I gagged again as I felt I was being watched. Suddenly, I concluded that my footsteps were not echoing. There was something else making footsteps. I walked more and the footsteps stopped when I stopped. As I walked, my heart was racing now. I was terrified, but I thought it was just Cole messing with me. I was trying to rationalize it. But this was instantly debunked as I could feel the cold breath of whatever this thing was on top of my head. Cole is five or six inches shorter than me, so this didn't make any sense. If it was a human, wouldn't the breath be warm? The stench got stronger as I walked quicker. Then I got the urge to stop. I did, I was frozen, and I couldn't move. I couldn't scream. After a few seconds, I turned around, and there was absolutely nothing. I gagged as the scent got more robust. I tried to run back, but then I froze again, this time by no accident. I did not want to move at this moment, because I heard Cole call my name. But it was off. It was silenced in a way. It did not sound real. Uh, I was terrified, however. Uh, I called back reluctantly. I wished I hadn't heard. I, I wished I hadn't done this at all. I wish I just didn't interact. I wish I just ran away. Because in reply to me, I heard, No, help, I don't want to die. Then he screamed. At that moment, I knew it was not Cole. I could hear it coming closer. I tried to run back to my tent, but it was far too late. The creature. This thing. It was nine to ten feet tall. It had an inhuman face and pale skin. It was freakishly skinny. I looked at it, and it looked at me. Finally, I don't know why I did this, but I decided to throw a rock at it and run. As I was running, I felt something hit my back. I don't know if it was a claw or what, but I ran faster and faster because of that. That was the last time I saw it. Luckily, I wasn't injured, and luckily I made it back to camp safely. But the moment I got there, uh, I started yelling, hooting, and hollering. Everybody said that this was some sort of coyote, but I knew this was no coyote. The rangers, the camp counselors, everybody wanted me to believe that this was just some sort of coyote. But I know what was really out there. Unknown Sounds from the Finnish Woods by Anonymous Me and my friend, whose alias is Elizabeth, always go on evening walks when I am sleeping over at her or her sister's house. Our usual route is going through the woods by a friend's house to the store and going back through the woods and going to a weird thing where you can see the sea and the view. This is in February, in Finland, which means that it was pitch dark at about 8 to 9 a.m. We were on our way back, about halfway to view this thing, and we heard a sound that sounded like a flute, but at the same time, didn't. Basically, a harmonic, unnatural sound. We looked back and saw nothing. She asked me if I heard it. I said, yeah, do you still want to go to Coco Stenin? I asked and she nodded. We walked about a meter or so and we heard it again, but it was distant this time. At that moment, I started to pay more attention because the first time we heard it, it sounded like it was on our right in the woods, and the second time it sounded like it was 20 meters away, on the sand path we were walking on. When we arrived to the view thing, we walked seven steps up to the first level, and I heard a crack in the trees, and on the way there we heard the sound from all different directions and varying directions and distances. We walked up the first narrow flight of stairs to the second level, which was smaller than the first, and we walked up the last flight of stairs to get to the top level, which is a square, about the size of 3 meters times 3 meters. I sat on the bench, overviewing the rest of the forest and the sea. 
my back turned from where we came from, and Elizabeth sat on the side where her back was turned to the path. And that's when it hit me. We were hearing the sound, but didn't hear any type of footsteps. It was dark out when we went, so the sky was dusted with stars. She looked at me. What? Don't like, I don't like that you're looking at me like that. You're kind of scaring me. What is it? I looked up and heard the sound again, but it sounded like it was under us now. Um, can we go, like, now? I walked before her because I'm stronger than her and can somewhat fight. When we were down from the view thing, we sped walked, and then boom, we heard the sound deep in the trees on our left, and not even two minutes later, we heard it right behind us. She started walking faster and I looked back. There was no one there. Let's run until we're at the pavement, I said, and she agreed. When we were finally on the pavement, we crossed the street twice so that we were on the road leading home. When we heard that sound from down the hill, which is impossible, I asked her if we could run 15 meters and then walk. We did that and didn't hear a sound after that. We thought it was over, but no. When we were about to cross the street to get to her house, we heard it again. It was directly behind us, or at least I did. She claimed that she didn't hear it that time. She was fumbling with her keys to try to get down. We ran down the seven steps and opened the door. I tried pulling the door closed, but it felt like someone was pulling it open. When the door finally shut closed, we ran up the two flights of stairs as fast as we could while being quiet and opened her apartment door and quickly went to her in her sister's room. When we got there, her sister asked why we were so shocked and spooked. We told her and their mother. She said it was probably a fox. And over the course of the night, I kept hearing footsteps in the staircase of the apartment building. The footsteps would occasionally stop at the front door, and then I would hear taps on the door, and then it went down again. This repeated the entire night. The neighbors are all old, so they were all asleep. And who would do that all night? The next morning, we searched up what a fox sounded like, and it definitely was not a fox. The Pale Skinny Man by Anonymous I experienced this back when I was 14 years old. Now I am 23 years old. Back when I lived on the outskirts of a small town in Montana, Behind my home, there was a forest. Now, I have never stepped a foot into these woods until that day. The only time I had even gotten close to that forest was when I was tasked with walking the family dog, Charlie. Now, Charlie was a pretty big dog. I had never seen him cower before. On one of our walks, I heard noises in the woods. It was the sound of a branch snapping. Occasionally, when I took walks with Charlie, I would keep hearing these noises. One important thing to mention, though, is that whenever I took Charlie out during the day, nothing would ever really happen, but during dusk and dawn or nighttime, I would always hear these noises. The day I decided to head into the woods was an extraordinary day because it was my 14th birthday. After everyone was in bed, I had snuck out with Charlie, and we navigate our way through, or, well, tried to. We ended up getting lost and came upon an abandoned shed in the middle of the woods, then the last thing I expected happened. Charlie started whimpering. That was never a good sign. I had wondered if there was someone there, but I couldn't see anybody. I didn't think I would need any form of protection, so I didn't have any with me. And then I heard the sounds. The sounds of crunches and snaps. All of the wildlife went silent. I was terrified, so all I could do was run to the shed and hide. Something or someone got closer. I heard the leaves crunching. It was the only way I could tell how close it was getting. Then a loud bang resonated through the woods. It was walking on top of the roof. I couldn't stop shaking, but I'd like to think that Charlie could now tell how scared I was because he started licking me. Around five or ten minutes later, it hopped off the roof and I peeked out the nearest window. There was a human-like creature with grotesque long limbs, pale skin, just like the moon, jagged bones, and joints. It was extremely thin. Its spine was protruding underneath its skin. 
Instead of bumps on the spine, they were like tips of a knife. I felt sick to my stomach and almost hurled. I managed to see its face. It was roundish. Its eyes were beady. They looked black, but I'm not completely sure. They were glossy like the eyes of a doll. Lifeless. And soon it had started to walk away, but not without turning back to me and letting out a demonic roar, like the roar of a lion mixed with the call of a raven. I think it knew I was there. I don't know what prevented it from killing me, but whatever it was, I am forever grateful. Remember, if there are woods near you and you hear strange sounds, leave it alone. Never forget that there are things out there that won't be as merciful as it was to me. And if anyone knows what this is, please let me know in the comments.